start. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is the Smokes This Over podcast show. I'm your host, uh, Derek Franklin, and I am here with Stephanie Deutsch. Uh, we are privileged to talk uh, about her book called You Need a Schoolhouse, Booker T. Washington, Julius Rosenwald, and the Building of Schools for the Segregated South. Uh, Stephanie uh, is the author, uh, of course, and I believe uh, her father was a, a foreign service uh, 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 employee worker, and I believe she lived sometime in New Zealand and also uh, in France. Uh, she has a degree from Brown, and I believe you have a post-secondary degree uh, from Harvard, uh, and so you're far smarter than I am. <laughs> And so it's great. Not necessarily. <laughs> it's great to have you uh, on the show, and it's it's wonderful to be able to talk to you uh, about uh, this particular book here. It's a great read. I really enjoyed it. It's the kind of book that um, you say, "Well, you know, it's really getting late, and I really should go to sleep, but I really want to read another chapter, uh, and <laughs> I just have to deal with the occasional nodding off uh, at my desk." So I, I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed your book. Well, you know, Derek, for a writer to be told that their book is hard to put down, that's the highest compliment you could pay. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the things I was very aware of when I wrote it is that a lot of history is, um, is written sort of assuming that you know the backstory. Mm -hmm. And so it piles on details that are hard to, hard to, um, process if you don't know the bigger picture. Right. And in some ways, I was sort of lucky. I, um, when I started my research, there was actually a lot I didn't know. Mm -hmm. As you said, I, I have a lot of education, but I initially went in the direction towards having grown up in the foreign service. I went towards kind of foreign topics and I majored in mm -hmm. Russian at college and mm -hmm. I got a um, master's degree in Soviet Union area studies. So, you know, I was thinking about kind of the larger world and I pulled back. I was home for several years raising my kids. And then I decided I wanted to do some writing and that I wanted to write biography because as a child, I had enjoyed reading biography so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came upon the topic of Julius Rosenwald and his relationship with Booker T. Washington, I was just astounded how much of that history I did not know. Right. And I certainly knew the name Tuskegee, I knew the name Booker T. Washington, but there was a whole lot that I did not know. Right, right. So am, am I to understand it correctly that there is a family connection to Julius Rosenwald through your there, husband? There is. My husband is a great grandson of Julius okay. Rosenwald. Okay. And um, people are sometimes surprised when I say this, but it was not a topic that was ever really talked about. Mm -hmm. um, but when I started with the idea of writing a biography, one of David's cousins said to me, well, you might think about Julius Rosenwald. And right. initially I thought, well, I don't know, a businessman, Sears, you know, I, I wasn't sure that it would really captivate my interest. Mm -hmm. But there was one existing biography of him, and I read it. And when I got to the part about his relationship with Booker T. Washington, that really interested me because it was a a topic I didn't know much about, and b it was so clearly important. And it's it's really interesting in these kind of fraught times in which we live, where the black white kind of situation is so front and center. And a lot of times it's very antagonistic, even though it doesn't have to be. It's, it's quite interesting to look at these two great gentlemen and also the time period in which they lived and collaborated together to get something as important done as building schools uh, in, in the rural South. And it, it I, I, I tend to look at the glass half full <laughs> it's difficult sometimes to keep that kind of perspective but when i when i read when i read your book and i and i uh, learned about 
the the partnership, I said, well, we, it, there's hope for there's hope for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I I think you're right. They were definitely both half full kind of guys. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that interested me was that despite the fact that you know Rosenwald was a son of German Jewish immigrants, mm -hmm. uh, Booker T. Washington grew up a slave. Mm -hmm. You know, they came from very different backgrounds. Right. But I think when they met they had several things in common. Right. They were actually both very pragmatic people. They were problem solvers. Right. They weren't so much, um, you know, they weren't sort of philosophers or, or um, deep thinkers. They were more, one of the reason Rosenwald had been so successful with Sears was he was a good manager. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. Richard Sears, the guy who founded the company was great at promotion. You know, mm -hmm. he could, one of his friends said he could sell a breath of air. <laughs> but he was not as good at getting your order delivered to you on time. Right. And, you know, and so Julius Rosenwald, what he brought into the company was he was a manager. He said, mm -hmm. okay, if we're going to, if we're going to send out these ads promoting all this great stuff we have, we have to deliver, you know, we have to come through and we have to stand mm -hmm. by our promise that you're not satisfied to get your money back. Right. And so, and, and of course, Booker T. Washington you know, he had built Tuskegee from nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and by the time the two men met, this is sort of a stunning factor. Tuskegee was one of the largest institutions of education in the South. Right. Not just one of the largest for Blacks. It was one of the largest in the South. And Booker T. Washington had built it from nothing. Right. Um, so they, they recognized something about each other, that they were both... Um, problem solvers and they were they were both pretty good pretty good problem solvers right right if we can i'd like to talk about a little bit about booker t's background and then talk a little bit about julius rosenwald's background and then kind of uh, bring them together and then talk about uh the work that they did uh to build the schools so an obvious turning point in booker t's life is when uh he's emancipated uh, from slavery. I believe he's born in 1856, 1865. He's emancipated, so he's nine uh, years old. I think around 11 years old, he goes to work uh, in the coal mines, and so it's, it's, it's very tough uh, working conditions. Um, but he, while there, he hears about uh, these two gentlemen talking about uh, the school for Black folks, and it happens to be Hampton, and so he's determined uh, to go. And sometime in there, uh, he is introduced to a, a lady by the name of Mrs. Ruffner, and I believe her husband, uh, did he own the coal mine? Or I think he was a, a wealthy uh, individual, um, but he applied to be her houseboy. And she had been known to be notoriously rough on <laughs> her houseboys and, and Booker T was, was, was no uh, exception, but he seems to have settled in and, and learned uh, some pretty good lessons from Mrs. Ruffner and wanted to try to get you to, to expand on that a little bit or fill in the holes that I might have, have, have put out there. Yeah, well, that is a great story. I just, to rewind a little bit, one thing that I did find interesting um, about Booker T was you know, we often imagine slaves on these huge plantations in the South, of which, of course, there were men. But he walked on a and a he born in is in, uh, the Western Virginia, and it's a National Park Service site. And I've been there. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's fascinating about it is the house where he lived with his mother and his sister and his brother is 10 steps from the house where the master lived, the family okay. that he worked for. Mm -hmm. And it was an unusual situation in that the, they were close, the mm -hmm. families were close. Mm -hmm. And um, I think possibly that was one thing that enabled him to have a less, um, a less bitter view of slavery than some people did. He really hadn't experienced, I mean, obviously to be enslaved is terrible, but sure. He he uh, he he had you know he had been in a family context, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the stories that you you picked up one of the stories that I love is him as a small boy in that coal mine mm -hmm. and hearing these guys talk about a school and kind of creeping a little closer to hear well what's the school and mm -hmm. it's Hampton, 
But another story that I love was the story about how one of his jobs was to ride on the back of the horse with mm -hmm. the daughter of the family that enslaved him because she was a teacher. And right. he'd ride on the back of the horse to the school. And then his job was to bring the horse back so it could work in the fields. Mm -hmm. But he talked about how he got down off the horse and he went up and he peered in the window of the schoolhouse. Mm -hmm. And he saw the children in there with their books and their maps and their teacher. And to him, it looked like paradise. Right. And um, to me, that's very of um, him what he so it was a very key thing for him and he got the job with Mrs. Ruffner who was as you said she had a reputation for being very fussy mm -hmm. very particular right but she was also she had been a teacher and I think she recognized that here was a boy who was um, smart he hadn't had the opportunity for education but he was smart he worked hard he was determined and so she really encouraged him to think about Hampton and to go and and to get that education. And she was she was a um, she was a mentor, really. You know, she right. was. Um, and so then, when he went to Hampton, um, Hampton now, of course, is a world class university. But then right. it was a school to educate teachers, mm -hmm. and um, it was it was kind of like a work study thing. You worked your way through, and so the entrance exam was not, what did you know about geometry or anything else? The entrance exam was, could he clean a classroom? Right. And because of that training that the fussy Mrs. Ruffner had given him, he was pretty good at that. And right. um, so got in. And um, and I, I think the, if my memory serves me correctly, the lady who gave him the test took her hand and wiped it over the wind seal, window seal and the desks and she yeah. couldn't find any any dust. And I remember reading in perfectly the perfectly clean. Yeah. And I remember reading in the book that that Booker seemed to have this this mentality of, oh, this is the interest exam. I got this. I'm in. Uh, and so right, right. It's, this it, I can do. Yeah. It's interesting how uh, a tough a tough work situation was the perfect preparer for him uh, to make the next step uh, in his very legendary uh, uh, career in going uh, in going to Hampton. Uh, if, it's my understanding that he does quite well uh, at Hampton. Uh, I believe he graduates in June of 1875. He joins the debate team and is known as a, uh, a well-known debater and orator. And that seems to, those seem to be skills that would serve him well after he leaves oh, absolutely. Hampton. And as he embarks upon uh, this journey of of uh, becoming Booker T. Washington, this this great figure, the next Fred, Frederick Douglass, some some say it after after Frederick Douglass uh, passed on, and want to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, um, yeah, that that ability to be a speaker was um, central, became central to to um, his career, and he was. Uh, you probably saw in my book. I have a photograph of him. Mm -hmm. I know of him as he was the, the grad speaker, the speaker at his graduation. Right. And um, and so that became one of his um, one of his real uh, talents uh, mm -hmm. was as a speaker. Mm -hmm. And um, every year he would make trips up north uh, as a speaker to to solicit funds for Tuskegee because mm -hmm. it was a state supported school. But it it always need, was in need of funding and those speaking tours provided a steady stream of interest and, and uh, money from up north and, and other places. Right, right. So he graduates from Tuskegee and he's one of the commencement speakers. Uh, Hampton, believe. from Hampton. Uh, Hampton, Hampton, I'm sorry. <laughs> so he graduates from right. Hampton. He's one of the commencement speakers. Uh, and then he goes back to West Virginia and there he runs a school of about 80 to 90 uh, students of various ages. And he's teaching them reading, writing, and algebra. And at night, I believe he's working with adults who wanted to make up for their education that they hadn't received uh, when they were yeah. younger. So it seems as though he's always, he's kind of been on this track of running yeah. school, uh, providing educational kind of opportunities 
to those who otherwise uh, wouldn't have got it. And want to get your thoughts on that as well. Yeah, I mean, he obviously had a calling in that in that um, direction. Uh, and he also was a person of, I think, really exceptional energy. I mean, he just, um, he put a lot, he put a lot into this. Um, and he, he uh, it was a calling. Um, and you probably remember from my book, he did flirt briefly with um, going into the ministry, which right. was one of the kind of paths that many of the, you know, newly emancipated chose. But he ended up going in the education, sort of a similar field, but a different version. And mm -hmm. education was the area where he decided he would make his mark. And so then he was very lucky. Um, the state of Alabama wanted to found a school sort of like Hampton to educate African-American teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, you might remember one of my chapters is called No White Man Could Do Better. Right. Because the principal of Hampton was asked to please recommend a well-qualified white man to come down here and start this school. Right. And he recommended Booker T. Washington and said, I know of no white man who could do better. Right. Right. And just to just to deviate just a little, I know this isn't necessarily something that you cover in detail in your book, but I know from just my knowledge of Booker T. and W.E.B. Du Bois that they didn't see eye to eye on uh, how best to uplift the Black race. In many respects, Booker T is viewed as someone who is perhaps inauthentic because he doesn't put up more of a fuss or he doesn't put up more of a fight as opposed to W.E.B. Du Bois, who is pretty much a lot of times uh, in your face. And you have people in the 21st century who tend to think that way about Booker T. But we have to remember it's not May 2021. <laughs> it's no. it's 19. It, well, it's 1896. It's 1901, yeah. and the the America South of that time is much different than it is now. And there are certain things that Booker T just had to do yeah. to make sure that the school would not just survive but thrive, uh, and it may look like that he was uh, being weak, but actually he's being very practical uh, so that the school could, could live on. It's interesting that you bring that up. Whenever I talk at a school or anywhere, the subject of Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois often comes up mm -hmm. and they're always um, framed as these sort of arch enemies. And I think the truth was a little more complicated and a little more subtle than that. It's right. easy to forget that first Booker T. Washington was a sort of half generation younger than W.B. Du Bois. He's confronting a very different situation. Mm -hmm. Newly emancipated people who, you know, had had no chance for education. Generation upon generation, no mm -hmm. education, no education. So emerging from that with this incredible hunger for education. Mm -hmm. And um, and then he lived in the South. You know, Du Bois is from Massachusetts. Right. And so his experience was quite different. Mm -hmm. And um, the way I look at it, both of them made contributions that were very much needed. Mm -hmm. And um, and certainly the reverence that people had at the time for Booker T. Washington was testament to to the extraordinary uh role he played in that in those first sort of the last decade of the 19th century first decade of the 20th century he was the african-american of whom people were proud mm -hmm. um you know he had accomplished he he knew he had dinner with theodore roosevelt at the white house you know right. he had he had tea don't you love this detail he had tea with queen victoria at windsor wow. castle Right. Don't you wish you could be a fly on the wall for that one? Absolutely. Um, yeah. I mean, he 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 accomplished so much and people had great pride in him. And I think he and Du Bois, yes, they ended up on different sides of of that of that argument. But I think they both actually respected each other. Right. Right. Very good. Very good. If we can shift now, so to speak, to uh, Rosenwald 
his father, Samuel, comes over to uh, the country, the United States from Germany. And I believe he settles in Baltimore around 1854. He starts off as, 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 a, as a peddler or more uh, succinctly as a, as a traveling salesman. Uh, and uh, he seems to instill uh, a pretty good work ethic in Julius uh, and his his other siblings, but also uh, he he gets he connects with uh, a spirit uh, of self help as well. From what I read in your book, the self help uh, from Samuel and, Ju and and Julius starts out uh, in a, in a Jewish perspective, them helping one another. But as Julius attains wealth he recognizes that it is his duty and his calling uh, to help others uh, as well. And just wanted to get your, get your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's very interesting that, so, so Julius has almost like an archetypal American story. Mm -hmm. You know, the parents who are both immigrants, um, they end up in Springfield, Illinois, and you know, you just couldn't make up the nice detail that he grows up in a house right across the street from Abraham Lincoln's house. Lincoln's right. not there anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, so he grows up sort of imbued with this the reverence for Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And um, for his doing one, one of the sacred tenets is helping, helping the strong community, particularly since so many places are a minority and in many cases a sized minority they because they need to help each other mm -hmm. and um so he, he he definitely grew up imbued with that that um community spirit and then what happens that's so very interesting is in the first decade of the 20th century as he makes his money and becomes a wealthy man um he, one of the things he does is he's raising money to send to Jewish victims of pogroms in Europe, mm -hmm. you know, these sort of state sponsored riots. Right. And he's, he's that he's very aware of that and he's donating money. And I think in 1908, when there's this major riot in Springfield, his hometown, mm -hmm. he wasn't there at the time, but he certainly knew about it, read about it in the paper. And he began to make to kind of equate in his mind what was happening to black people with what had made his parents leave Europe. Mm -hmm. They left Europe because of anti-Semitism and because right. of lack of opportunity. Right. And he began to see a, a similar situation mm -hmm. in the way black people were being treated. And he began to feel um, that the country couldn't thrive if a significant portion of the population was kind of deliberately pushed to the side. Mm -hmm. And um, in one of his speeches, he said, we like to look down on the Russians for the way they treat their Jews, mm -hmm. but what we're doing here to black people is not that different. Right. And I think that's really, it's a great example of, you know, Rosenwald, we didn't mention the fact that he never graduated from high school. Right. Mm -hmm. um, he, w he went to public school, he did well, but he left school to go and be apprenticed to his uncles who were in the clothing business. Mm -hmm. But he was an incredible, um, he, he, was, he was always curious about things and he was a reader and he liked to meet people and talk to people. And so he was, he was smart, you know, he, he wasn't well educated, but he, he was, I think in the, in the um, education business, don't we refer to lifelong learners? Right. I think Julius <laughs> Rosenwald was a great example of a lifelong learner. Right. He was always curious about things. He was always reading things. And, and um, one of the things he read was one of his friends sent him a copy of Up From Slavery. Mm -hmm. And he read it. And he was very interested, very um, moved by the story. And so when the opportunity came to meet Booker T. Washington, mm -hmm. he was anxious, anxious to do it. Right, right. And, and it's interesting you, you brought up uh, the fact that Julius didn't finish high school. That was going to be the next place where I go. I think, as you said, he dropped out at 16 and he accepts an offer uh, from, uh, I think it's his uncle's 
uh, to learn the clothing business. And he does that for uh, six years. And that seems to be a passion of his uh, in that particular uh, business. And, and while he's with his uncles in New York, he's op he opens up uh, a clothing business. It does kind of modestly well, but then he eventually sells that and he moves back uh, to Springfield. And not too long thereafter, he gets the opportunity to buy into and become an owner uh, in Sears, which really launches his uh, career and his, and his great wealth uh, 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 to a certain extent. And I uh, wanted to get your thoughts about that. I thought it was, I thought it was very interesting how he kind of got to Sears. He goes off with his brothers for six years. He tries his own thing in New York, kind of goes kind of well. He comes back uh, uh, home to, to Springfield. His brother, Aaron, I think it is, was his brother-in-law, Aaron. Uh, well, I think it's his uncle, Aaron Nussbaum, does quite well yeah. at the West Columbian Exposition, where he's given the ability uh, to sell flavored soda, and he makes a lot of money, and he uses that, Aaron does, as part of the money to buy into Sears, and then uh, uh, Julius takes what he has, uh, and they both acquire 25% ownership of Sears, and then Sears has the other uh, 50%. I thought that was all interesting how all that played out over those oh, particular years. I want to get your get you to expand on that or touch on that if you like. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, uh, he had had sort of started in business in New York and then decided to open a um, a business to manufacture men's clothing. Mm -hmm. And he decided to do it in Chicago because in, if he stayed in New York, he'd be in competition with his uncles. Mm -hmm. And Chicago was a huge boom town um, at this point. And so he and his brother moved back to Chicago and, and a cousin, the three of them start this business to manufacture men's suits. Mm -hmm. So when the subject of Sears comes up, Sears actually owes him money because he's been supplying suits that mm. Richard Sears is selling through his catalog. Mm. And, you know, it's interesting. I find it really interesting that almost exactly 100 years after Sears' success, we had this phenomenal um, explosion of internet shopping. Mm. Um, and in some ways, it's very equivalent to what Sears did 100 right. years ago. You know, right. you lived on a farm out in the country. You didn't have stores to go to. Right. And um, if you were black, you maybe didn't want to go to the stores in town because they possibly, you know, weren't that excited to see you. But mm -hmm. the catalog gave everyone the opportunity, no matter where you lived or who you were, to look through those pages. And, you know, by the by the early part of the 20th century, they were selling everything. They mm -hmm. were selling not just clothing, but um, farm equipment, chickens, mm -hmm. um, you know, shoes, tombstones, <laughs> everything, books, books. Yeah, yeah, everything. And, um, and so it was, it, it was a remarkable sort of revolution, similar to what we've experienced with the internet. Mm -hmm. um, I forget what you, where, where we were, where we were going with this. What well, was that, next? That, that, that's fine. What's next is 1895, Julius buys into Sears. But 1895 is also uh, a pivotal time, so to speak, for Booker because Booker he gives uh, what many might term as a life-changing speech at the Cotton States and International Exposition in Atlanta. And it was a huge fair like the Chicago fair, but it was focused uh, in the South. And it, it seems as though he gave a, a very good speech one of the, I think one of the things he said was cast down your bucket where you are. And so this kind of uh, kind of launches him on the uh, national stage. So to yeah. speak. 1895 with Rosenwald Sears and then you have 1895 with Booker, he seems to be coming into his own. And that's interesting how those, those that one year helps those two men converge in their legacy, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, that that was, you know, that was one of those details that you you couldn't make that up, but it 
I found it very interesting because for each of them, it was a real turning point. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that um, people used to say, you're our Frederick Douglass now. Frederick Douglass died in 1895. Right. And so yeah. just as Booker T is making this speech that makes him well known, mm -hmm. the Douglas has died. And so people were writing to him and saying to him, you're our Douglas now. And, and I mean, he was very much, yeah, W.B. Du Bois wrote him a letter um, mm -hmm. praising the speech and saying it was a word fitly spoken. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everyone was just so enthusiastic and so admiring mm -hmm. uh, of what he had accomplished and, and kind of the, the role he stepped into. Right, right. So in, in transitioning now to where they come together to build the schools. Booker, in Booker T's mind, the greatest need for Blacks was education and not rights. So I think his reasoning was, what good are rights if you don't have the education to understand them? And so oh, yeah. he seems to embark upon this uh, crusade, if we can call it that, uh, to try to provide education at a level lower than what it is, what he's able to provide uh, at Tuskegee. And Booker T and Julius's paths cross and a friendship seems to be formed when they meet one another at a YMCA uh, in Chicago. I think that, that the effort is to try to build a YMCA for Blacks in uh, Chicago and they meet and they seem to hit it off. And this seems to be the, the genesis of their relationship uh, with one another. I was wondering if you could uh, share your thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating to, to imagine um, these two men coming together. They were both in Chicago for, of course, Julius lived there and, and Booker T had come for, it was actually, um, a YMCA celebration. They were both interested in the YMCA movement. And so Booker was there and Julius gave a luncheon to introduce him to people in Chicago. And, uh, he took him to lunch at Sears and he, his Sears huge state-of-the-art uh, plant on the Western side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And so the two men had lunch there in the executive dining room. And um, so then Booker T. Washington says to Julius, okay, now I want you to come visit Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, he had already invited him to be on the board of Tuskegee. And Julia said, well, I can't be on the board if I haven't seen the place. Right. So in the fall of 1911, uh, Julius fills a private railroad car with family and friends from Chicago. Mm -hmm. And it takes them, you know, two days to get down there. Mm -hmm. uh, Tuskegee is 40 miles east of Montgomery. So it's you know, it's, it's, it's not even in a main city. It, it took a while to get there. Right. Uh, and they spent three days on the campus and uh, they were extraordinarily impressed by what they saw. Mm -hmm. um, Tuskegee has a beautiful campus that was designed uh, by architects there at Tuskegee. It was built of bricks that had been made by the students there. And uh, it was just imbued with this incredible um, spirit of, of both excellence and um, optimism. Mm -hmm. And I think Julius really was extremely impressed with what he saw. And um, the, the, I love the description of the, the last night he was there, there was a, um, a service in the chapel. And one of the things they had done at Tuskegee, similar to what they did at Fisk, where they had the Jubilee Singers, they sang spirituals, mm -hmm. or what, what um, some people called plantation songs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then there was no radio, there was no records. I mean, Julius had never heard this before. Right. And it, it, it helped him connect and, and feel very um, simpatico, very, very, mm -hmm very much part of what they were doing there. So he agreed to serve on the board and um, he and, and Washington started this correspondence and visiting in each other's homes. The following spring, um, uh, Washington came up to Chicago and stayed in the, in the uh, Rosenwald's house. Mm -hmm. And um, I, one of the exciting points for me in my research was 
I got to interview Julius Rosenwald's son, William, wow. who when I talked to him was over 90, wow. but he remembered when Booker T. Washington had come to his house as a house guest. And I think he was about seven or eight at the time. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, oh my gosh, what, what do you remember about that? And he said, well, I, I didn't really think anything about Booker T. Washington, but I did wonder why he and my father spent such a long time in my dad's office with the door closed. <laughs> and I think that was because they had a lot to talk about. Right. And Julius was just very interested in kind of picking Washington's brain. You know, what, what did he know? What did he think? What, what, what were his plans? And so one of the things that came out of these conversations was Washington explaining to Rosenwald the, the almost complete lack of educational facilities in the South, especially in rural areas, which so much of the South was. Um, public education was mandatory at that time, but the states divided their dollars unequally between a system for white and a system for blacks. Yeah. And, um, and then the thing that Washington explained to Rosenwald that really hooked him was in lots of places, the people who live there are already raising money. They want a school. Right. And these are poor people. These are sharecroppers. These are farmers. They don't have a lot of money, but what they have, they're willing to give so that they can have schools for their children. Mm -hmm. And um, Rosenwald had always been interested in the idea of sort of matching grants, that I'm not gonna give you something, but I'll partner with you so that we can, together we can create it. Right. And when he heard that these communities were already raising money, he was very um, impressed with that. Mm -hmm. And so they started this first, the, the, the sort of the pilot project was six schools in the area right around Tuskegee, $300 from Rosenwald, $300 from the community. Mm -hmm. And they built these six schools and um, Julius Rosenwald visited not all of them, but at least one or two right. and was very impressed to see not just the children, but the whole community mm -hmm. had rallied around because they had all given money. And it was it was it, incredibly moving to him, the, the sacrifices that people really were willing to make and how important it was to them. And so from that developed this astounding program that mm -hmm. built over 5,000 schools. Right, right. And that's, it's, it's, it's interesting how high of a priority education was to uh, Blacks and, and Jews Rosenwald uh, and, and Jews and whites as well, I'm sure. But in, in you think of, the extreme poverty that existed uh, in the South, and you know, many people probably living not much higher than hand to mouth, were still able and motivated to put their pennies together to give the next generation a shot to ascend higher than they were at the time through uh, through these schools. And I and I and I think. Um, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the dollars that Blacks contributed were, were more than what Julius put up to, to build school. Yeah. This is an astounding fact. Well, this is two astounding facts in a way. One of the things that was so interesting about the Rosenwald School program was they managed to rope in the public school systems. Mm -hmm. So as I said, public education is mandatory. Mm -hmm. The states are dividing their money on each but knowing that they had this philanthropist in Chicago giving some money and the communities giving some money, the, the, the counties were encouraged to do more. So the, it was the, the local jurisdictions gave the largest amount of money for the schools. But after that, dollar for dollar, African-Americans gave more than Julius Rosen. Right. More. They did give more. And I think it's just an astonishing um, example of determination. And, and they not only gave money, uh, in some places they gave land, the land that the school was built on, and they gave materials and they gave labor. And um, uh, it was very much of a, of a, um, a community effort and um, an ongoing 
taking care of the school was a community thing. They would have Rosenwald days when the community would come out to end the garden and paint the walls. And, and, and it, it, that's, it, as you said, it's a testament to two groups willing to work together for uh, the betterment of generations that they probably won't never, some people probably never saw them flower uh, and grow as a, as a result uh, of these schools. Now, I think Booker T dies in 1915. Julius Rosenwald passes away. I think he has heart trouble in, in 32. But during that time, these schools are continuing to be built. And, and I want to say over 5,000 schools were built uh, in the South. This but when you add in the teachers' homes and the shop buildings that were also part of the program, it's over 5,000 structures. Okay. Right. And I think it's just, it's extraordinary. I mean, think about the number of communities that were impacted, the number of people who were participating in this program. It's, it's remarkable. And to your, and to that point, uh, I think it was, was it John Lewis who attended? Oh, yes, okay. John Lewis attended one. I think was, um, the poet Maya Angelou attended one. All right, Jay Johnson. I think his dad attended. Yes, one of the schools. Uh, his no, his dad was a um, uh, worked for the Rosenwald Fund. Okay. Uh, his uh, and his dad was president of Fisk. Right. Um, and and so he grew up very much in the Rosenwald tradition. He, his, his dad didn't go to a Rosenwald school, but he worked for the fund. He was a sociologist, and yeah. And then Horseman Bond, I think that's Julian Bond's father. He worked for the Rosenwald uh, Fund. Uh, yeah, Horace the Fund. Um, and it was my privilege to, to meet Julian and, and actually travel with him. He, he gave um, civil rights tours mm -hmm. uh, for students at UVA where he taught. And, and uh, I managed to, my husband and I managed to go on several of those tours. Um, and Julian was very, uh, I mean, the Rosenwald Fund was a big thing in his father's mm -hmm. life and his father had great respect for Rosenwald. And, mm -hmm. and it, it's also interesting that the charitable foundation that Julia set up that did things other than fund the Rosenwald schools, I think he funded fellowships uh, and money was given to a lot of people that you and I and others uh, would know, I think is Zora Neil Hurston, Hurst, Langston Hughes, Ralph Bunch, Fra uh, Franklin E. Frazier, Charles Drew, the famous doctor in medical research, Marion Anderson. Uh, and I'm just scraping the surface over uh, uh, the individuals. And, it, and it's, it's very interesting how the charitable tentacles of Julius stretch out over great amounts of people and, and great amounts of years uh, to do the good uh, that he has done with those charitable foundations and, and fellowship dollars. Well, you know, uh, when um, the president of the Rosenwald Fund was a man named Edwin Embry, mm -hmm. and when he wrote the history of the fund after it closed down in 1948, he called the book Investment in People Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a good example of what Rosenwald's philanthropy did because he invested in people with the schools. You know, you're investing in children by giving them an education and you don't know exactly what they'll do with that, but they can't do anything if they don't have the education. Right. And then he invested in older people, established people or people at the beginning of their careers mm -hmm. with the fellowships which went to, as you say, just a remarkable who's who of, um, of achievers. And not only people who are well-known, like the people you mentioned, but people who are not so well-known, but who were a very solid uh, generation of educators and, and um, people who taught in colleges and, and just people of very, very solid achievement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wanted to make great read. contributions. Right, right. Wanted to read this, this quote to you. I got it from page 172 of your book. 
he, as in Booker T, stressed to his students, not the bitterness to which they were entitled and which he himself felt but did not publicly express, but ways they could take responsibility for their own lives and continue to have faith in their country, even at a time when their rights were being curtailed. And so it's a very moving quote, uh, very courageous uh, quote. Uh, obviously, it would have been something that would have been hard to carry out, especially uh, uh, at that time. And so I was just, I was just moved by, by that uh, portion uh, of the book and, and the quote. This has been a, a, a great discussion. Uh, it's been very enlightening. You were, you were able to fill in some things that, that I didn't even know uh, uh, about uh, in talking uh, about the book. I would like to give you a, a shot to talk about what you're doing now, what your next project uh, is and how people might uh, get in touch with you if, if you have a website or, or something of that sort or if you're working on sure. ongoing things now. Thanks. Well, one of the things I'm doing now that's pretty exciting is uh, I'm having a Rosenthal's National Historic Park. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, legislation actually passed Congress and was signed into law creating a feasibility study for a park commemorating Rosenwald and the schools. Okay. Uh, and the idea would be that the the visitor, main visitor center would be in Chicago where Rosenwald lived and where Sears was. And then there would be sites at several of the schools. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that's interesting about this is that um, there is to date no national historic site that commemorates a Jewish American. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are multiple sites, for example, that commemorate Booker T. Washington. Mm -hmm. His birth is a uh, is the site, um, but there is no single Jewish American who's been recognized in that way. And I think Julius Rosenwald is such an appropriate uh, person for that. So I've been, I've been spending kind of a lot of time on that. And if, if people are interested, if you Google Rosenwald Park campaign, you should, mm -hmm. and you can get it on the mailing list. We send out um, uh, four times a year, we send out updates about it. And I do a lot of the writing for that. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've wanted to write a book about the fellows because as you say, that's right. a fascinating topic. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I have a lot of competing demands on my time um, and, and my, uh, my, I don't know if I'll get to that, but, right. Right. Uh, but right. it's a story that I have felt such satisfaction in sharing. I mean, I, I am, one of the things that we didn't really talk about is how there's this very active movement to preserve the schools. Mm -hmm. And many people, the schools, this is an interesting part of the story. You know, when segregation ends, the schools close because right. they're black schools. Right. So institutions that have been created and lovingly sustained close their doors. Mm -hmm. And in the last 20 years, there's been a very active preservation movement pushed by alumni, people who went to the schools, who want to see that memory perpetuated and want to want to to um, ha hang on to that that um, that sense that was created that community sense and that and that participatory sense that was created by the schools. Right. So I've had the opportunity to visit lots and lots of schools that are being renovated, that are being preserved. You said you're in South Carolina. Uh, yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Are you in Charleston or? Uh, I'm, I'm in Rock Hill, South Carolina. I'm about 15 or 20 minutes from Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. Well, there are, yeah, there, there are lots of schools around there. Oh, North mm -hmm. Carolina, not South. You know, North Carolina was the state with the most schools. Right. They had 850. Wow. I mean, that's just, that's just extraordinary. That's phenomenal. Um, and uh, so there's a lot of preservation work going on. And I always love it when I get invited to one of those uh, events because I really enjoy meeting the people who went to the school and who care about the school and who want to perpetuate this story. Right, right. Very good. Very good. Well, we'll have the link to your book in the show notes and some of the other uh, uh, projects and things you mentioned. We'll link to those uh, in the show notes. Once again, I really appreciate your time 
this was time well spent. Uh, I learned a lot and you know, I'm very encouraged uh, by the content uh, of the book and what it could mean uh, for us as a people uh, moving forward. And I just thank you once again for uh, coming on the show uh, and agreeing to talk. Well, thank you. It was really, really, um, it was great to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night and take care. Good night.